What is Avatar Frontiers of Pandora, and who the hell is it for? At times, it's sliding through the tall grass, slaughtering invaders, taking out enemies, grabbing some fleshy liquid-filled pods from an alien tree, and chugging them down. Then, leaping on the back of your four-eyed pterodactyl thingy and flying up to some floating islands, because it looks fun. Then, seeing a diseased corpse-out section of a massive part of the forest and crafting some arrows and diving deep to deliver terror onto a bunch of enemies, while simultaneously destroying the machine poisoning the land, only to see it refresh itself. Then, going home, hanging out, kitting up your cat, and nabbing a little sleepy time after outfitting Bojangles with a cool military vest and some cloth and nuts to cover his... Well, and that's just a day in the life of the Na'vi. But what is a game made by the Division devs on their own engine snowdrop that's open world in a jungle environment with multiple loops feel like? There's an old D&D saying, the problem isn't the dragon, it's the fire it breathes. And Avatar has a distinct danger of being considered nothing more than a side spinoff of the Far Cry series, despite different devs and an engine. But is it? Subscribe for reviews as well as more podcasts coming up. Rogue Trader will be the next one, most likely. The best fictions are those that start out with that initial premise, the first turn that makes you wonder what's going on, that intrigues you while it introduces, captivates while it catapults you into the game. Avatar is none of those things. The game's first 10 minutes feels like a poorly done mod, with odd story moments, weird clumsy anticlimactic fade scenes, and a stealth and chase section that feels like a solid C-plus development school first level project. Weirdly bland locations and time jumps. And then you get outside. And God Damn. It's really rare to have a moment of visual dichotomy that's so profoundly delivered that you sit back and say, holy crap, you realize you're having a hero moment, one that many game devs have talked about delivering and saying that over and over again. That's Avatar once you actually get out into the open world. And from that point on, the world's your oyster, mostly. Let's talk about the story and just get it out of the way. This may sound characteristically blasé, the way it is, the first 15 or 30 minutes is a tutorial where you're introduced as one of a group of children stolen from your parents and trained to fight with the humans as part of a team. It's here where you meet the enemy, the bad guy, the dude who kidnapped you as a kid. And he could have come marching in in a cloak made of baby skins and a tattoo that says, I'm the bad guy and been less noticeable. It works though, and from that point on you're like, this is the guy I hate, these are the men that work for him, and they all need to die. During one of your trainings, things go terribly wrong and sets up the later events of the game. From then on, you're learning the ways of the Na'vi, having been removed from them as a child, learning to hunt, move, and interact with the world, explore, and yes, fly around on the back of your Ikrin or Dire Horse. Unsurprisingly, this is also where Avatar opens up. For example, when hunting in Avatar, despite it being a game, it's actually based on a huge amount of the movie's details to make sure it reflects the canon of the game and the movies, and this feeds back into the system. So for example, everything in the game is fully explained with science and even backing up how fruit and how you pick it can matter, or shooting some kind of animal for hunting. For example, tracking and making sure not to damage the animal's skin can be a difference between having something usable and not so usable as a product. So deciding to shoot a two pound glowing rabbit with a gun caliber charitably labeled as overkill is gonna leave you with a bloody smear on the ground. Now, you may notice I talked about hunting first. That's because Avatar is split for gameplay right down the middle, or in this game's case, a perfect triangle of experiences between combat, exploration, and hunter-gatherer, which is different than, let's say, the Far Cry titles. Each here feels important compared to the next. For example, hunting leads to dropping off food supplies to various clans, which then can raise your reputation as well as your ability to buy items, while also cooking those items and finding all manner of recipes can buff you in larger combats, as well as some of the mini-boss and semi-bosses that can pop up in different areas. More importantly, feeding it to your steed to keep them healthy during large battles or between them. However, animals also have their own roving grounds, sometimes different for normal versions as well as special more rare variants. You can also find them trapped by human enemies and culled for their parts. Each has a special weakness that can help you with taking them down without ruining the kill. Avatar thinks it's important enough that they even have their own filter on the map to track where different ones are, and using your Navi vision, you can track them using scent trails. That is if you don't want to just use the audio to track them, which I'll talk about in a moment because it is well worth mentioning. And to do all that and find those places, you're going to hit some exploration. Frontier's world is huge, even on the back of any of the steeds and not without their own dangers. But the vertically present feeling of the game is something that I just haven't seen in a long time. Some of the most profound use of verticality I've seen in a game yet, building off Avatar's idea of floating mountains with pools and items, herbs, animals and lore and stories to learn as you explore. But the scale is truly impressive. 
Spend in 20 minutes climbing up a mountain face and back trails to just cruising through a weeded jungle. But then you can dive down deep near the rivers and you can train your ikrin to grab food out of the water to feed itself. I'm going to say they're familiar in that way, but also alien in just the fact that there's so much vegetation and different animal flora and fauna that is quite surprising that it can feel completely unique. And your treks between all of these to perform the quests, collect, fight enemies, or just for fun is going to lead you to the realization that this game is huge. But no matter what you think, size doesn't always matter. It's what's contained within it, what's too much, and what's not enough. This is a difficult problem Far Cry games have wrestled with, where they're scared that if they go like 40 seconds without a major firefight or some random dude with a horse selling you guns on a trail, that there's a problem. You know it's bad when weed dispensary owners in the Pacific Northwest look at your game and go like, man, that's a lot of shops. Avatar does not actually have that problem at all. It centers the activities, reputations, rewards, and most everything else into specific locations with only side quests out in Pandora. It's a notable and worthwhile change that slightly flips the feeling of Pandora to something else that I really wasn't expecting. Let's discuss the combat, because this was expected in many ways. And like most open-world shooter games, Avatar hits those tropes. Weapon wheel, check. Different ammos, check. Explosive subcategory, check. Crafting items as you sprint just below the headline of some pissy marine, checkity check. The game offers short bows and long bows, heavy bows, shotguns, assault rifles, RPGs, bomb throwers, and more. And hell man, you got yourself a party. All of them are customizable with items that both affect their gameplay or just look cool, which matters if you're playing co-op with another friend who wants to jump in. By the way, co-op progress is saved for both, meaning if you jump into your game, you can skip any missions you've already done in somebody else's. Bow combat feels pretty good, with each fulfilling a different range, but the staff sling itself is hilarious and outside of that. This thing just throws out traps, not unlike Horizon Zero Dawn. But watching the human enemies realize that it's there if they saw you toss it and then seeing them shift around to try to not get blown to dust, only to have their friend who didn't see it run straight into it like a kamikaze pilot is awesome. The guns themselves feel pretty good. Each has their own place. Enemy AI is about what you would expect. Here, sometimes it shows great care and not blowing their own legs off on explosives, and the mechs have a wicked side dodge leap that can put what was in front of you behind you in a millisecond. Other times, they can't get out of a gate, and shooting them with arrows results in a consistent, we have sensed enemy presence in our sector. Yeah, no shit, Sherlock, as you turn three of their best friends into pufferfish by just filling them full of arrows. Harder difficulty is mostly just up the damage done and received, so not a lot of real choice there. I can see sometimes it feeling awesome, and other times it felt exactly as you would expect. Tearing someone out of their mech and then turning his power into a pinata with a well-placed arrow as thick as a friggin' baseball bat is also great. And also when exploring, it's moments of almost serene awe and a much more sedate exploration than we've seen in other games. These are all combined by one particular change that I see in Avatar that a lot of games haven't hit, and that is movement. Firstly, you can load the jump button like you're getting your arms and your legs into the jump, and at first it feels awkward, but then it just sort of clicks. And it's helped by the game's architecture having so many things to climb and run on. Huge mushrooms, vines, twisted trees, branches, massive leaves. It turns the game into this slick odd mixture of first-person shooter and parkour. The developers were also spot on on their planning to simulate the Navi's ability to climb and move by making the surfaces have just a bit more leeway on their movement than you would expect. A subconscious get out of hell free card for a moment that keeps the player connected to the world, mimicking expert climbing abilities far beyond what a normal human protagonist has. This all ties into the skill tree and how it works and how it's used and upgraded. Not really a surprise, Navi have skills in a skill tree that's not unlike other games of this type, with these trees based on survivor, or warrior, and so on. Additionally, you get to the highest normal skill in each tree, and you have an actual quest to get that skill, or a challenge of some way, effectively tying the world narrative with that growing power of the character altogether. I can fault Avatar for a couple different things, but making it feel like it's its own thing is actually not one of them. Most importantly, though, are the ancestral skills, a different subset that by finding more of these old flowers, you can get high as a kite and then attain more powerful ancestral skills, which are easily the most impactful in the game. And a couple deal directly with special moves you can use in combat, but it also has helpful skills in exploration. The game has a lot of hidden information, story and character wise in the locations of the world, and many of them are not hinted and usually end up getting you or benefiting you in some way. Speaking of benefits, you can assume that Avatar has a loot system, and it does, upgrading your character with items that you find in the game world as well. And in a unique turn, the human factions have a different kind of supply they want with its own little mini game for resources. Again, bravo to the dev for just saying, hey, let's go all in on making it seem slightly different. 
You can even upgrade your mount, adding the ability to attack flying creatures, fish for food, as I said before, and even more. Now, let's briefly touch on Ubisoft's connection, not the software. The feeling that despite playing games from different devs, there's a sameness to them. Does Avatar fall victim to that with these gameplay loops? Sure, in some ways. There's collectibles in some way. There's a cooking system, there's a hunting system, and upgrade systems. But even non-Ubisoft games have a number of those. What I can say is that I've walked away with a greater deal of solid, memorable, and different experiences in Avatar than I've had in the last four Far Cry games. And some of that can be the graphics and the performance. Kudos to the developers of Pandora on the phenomenal work they did in level design. In a world this overgrown and this lush, the idea of getting lost both lightly brush in the back of your mind at all times is also battling with playability and impacting the player. I was astonished that in a chase scene or climbing scenes, there's an intrinsic, almost instinctual nature to the level building. One example, of course, you've seen before was the Rookery, a massive mile-high climb to get a mount that involved climbing and leaping into the air with nothing below you and a fair amount of springing across gorgeous landscapes. And yet this level design consistently hints at where the path is. Small deviations in the terrain heights and other natural indicators consistently feed visual data to the player, and it's incredible to see how well they nailed that. This is also helped by the micro details that you can raise or lower in the settings with smaller debris and shrubbery being added as you move in a very natural way. While you do occasionally get pop in in the game, the amount of it is surprisingly low. There's a visual clarity in this image that is pretty astounding. It shows that Snowdrop is just one hell of an engine, and you can see that easily when we talk about the performance. With a new i7 at 5.2 and a 4090 with 64 gigs of RAM, performance-wise, I was getting 70 to 100 FPS with no upscaling at all at 4K, and most settings on ultra with a couple on high and just no stuttering whatsoever. Now that jumped to over 100 FPS using DLSS or FSR. FSR has frame gen, but at this time it looks like DLSS doesn't. With a 3080, the same performance can be eked out at around 1440p. While no particular one setting had a dramatic performance impact alone, I can say that spending some time inside of the game options to verify you need some of the settings to be up or down from Ultra can be worth it. And many times the changes between one or two settings are almost impossible to see, but combined, they can grab you another 10 or 15 FPS just with all those improvements. Be aware that those settings I was seeing higher and higher VRAM usage so that it can impact lower level cards even if they have high speeds. VRAM's a thing. To say it lightly, the game's performance is well above expectations I had due to the prior games we've got this year and in the last couple years. But because of the sheer amount that Avatar is showing on screen and its use of smart item fading in the pop-up, you either see it minimally or just very occasionally, and it can look incredible. Lastly, I do want to point out, I'm sure someone's going to say, oh, there's too much vegetation. But this is what I wanted since the first day I ever said, look at the grass in a game and kept repeating it each new generation with each stellar title that improved it. Hidden here or there are some muddy, noticeably poor detail textures, and the texture loading issue and a customization screen popped up even when using a Gen 4 NVMe drive, where occasionally you'd go to put on different armor and it would take a second for that armor to load. When it comes to bugs, I had a few pathfinding errors for a couple NPCs, a stutter during two particular cutscenes that went away after a couple seconds, as well as a couple times where I had low-res explosions and fire effects in some combats. But it's astounding to play and look at. It's just otherworldly. And that also extends to the audio. While yes, you're Navi, so you have Nam Vision, the ability to see threats and items in your world by pushing a button, the game's audio system is robust enough that you can do it without that, which will come in handy both in massive battles where your senses can get numbed, or if you decide to just mow down a ton of creatures and for a while lose the connection to the spirit world. FYI, this sounds terribly unfun, but it really wasn't a big deal. I submit to you that by the time you're mowing down a ton of Avatar's forest creatures, you're most likely doing it with a machine gun or explosives, and so being able to sense enemies is the least of your concerns. It's got incredible sound work when it comes to that. Throughout all of this, you can jump in and adjust a number of the sounds in the audio tab, including mixing for the sound effects to be mixed at a more noticeable level if you're seeing that that's become an issue. Being able to use the soundscape to identify enemies is something I talk about in a lot of games, and I love it when it works, especially if you don't want to use one of those different vision systems these games have. The far-off crunch and bang of a machine that digs into the earth can be heard almost a quarter of a mile away, and finding enemies, resources, or animals on sound alone is relatively easy. Speaking of noticeable, let's talk about the music. 
completely based on the style and musical details that we get from the original movies. It's got a really wicked tribal styled series of themes, but then it's also got some orchestral elements over the top as well. And you get a mix of that. So it creates this primal sophistication that fades in and out as you take on activities and enemies or explore new lands or find new items. It's got a really good score for the game. I can point out that at times the music seemed to cut out quickly or almost get confused when I stopped during a quest that was having me move quickly, like the orchestra thought something really amazing was going to happen, and then I sat staring at the sky for a minute. And that fade-off meant that some of the more subdued and subtle layers of the music weren't noticeable enough from the background wind and noise. Then I started moving, and the game was like, oh shit, he's running again, and almost fought to catch up. Speaking of catching up, this is where voice work in a lot of these games have an issue, is that they don't end up equaling the music or the sound. Voice work in Avatar is done well enough. Tropish to the point of noticing, but not to the point of being notably off-putting. Some characters like the old man who decided to cook you dinner are pretty cool, different, and others start to sound like they're just bog-standard guy with a quest kind of voiceover that you would expect. And how does all this come together? Let's talk about fun factor. Firstly, the game was incredibly fun, different style of title than I was expecting in all ways, and it is own thing, and I would say it is worth buying or getting right away. I make no excuses for general mehness in response to all the Far Cry games that have come for a while now. I'm just not a huge lover of them until they get some patches and sometimes never. But the changes to Avatar speak to me as someone who wanted something just different in theme. Avatar is one of the few games in the style from Ubisoft devs that for better or worse doesn't throw enemies at you every second. While there are some developments and definitely some intense fighting, the forest and its natural animal population are more center stage than generate a bad guy kind of locations we see in Far Cry games. And this is where the real comparisons come to light. By the sheer viewpoint, first person games share a basic DNA, a transparent likeness defined by the sheer delivery of the product. However, each is defined as they grow within their systems and their loops, where Call of Duty's flicky fast cowboy porn, Far Cry 5 was a world where apparently humans run in packs of gun-toting maniacs with infinitely spawnable trucks in Montana. And that's where Pandora feels different, not only in the exploration, despite some side missions and gameplay and collectibles, both an in-depth hunting system and combat that just feels a lot smoother and less like a catastrophic bullet hell gone wrong like Far Cry can do. Feels a bit more discreet, a little bit like Far Cry Primal as a sequel would be. This is augmented by a protagonist that, as I said, was larger, faster, and stronger than the humans are going against, and adding that flexibility in the combat. It just feels much smoother. Though, I think we can all agree the enemy AI should be shored up in these games. They still had difficulty sometimes trying to take out my berserking eight-foot-tall puss and boot smurf. Also, I'd like to see them go in and allow for you to do your own manual saves. The game saves of its own accord and seems to do so quite often, so there were no real issues there, but I would love to have my own ability to manually save. You can make multiple characters playthroughs by making a new game in the main menu, but currently multiple save points just aren't there. What was there was fun, and I was astonished to say that I had a lot more enjoyment than I thought, especially for a less action-packed title than I was expecting. The more exploratory and connected feeling of Avatar systems do a service to the entire Avatar fiction, and it feels good, and it resonates a bit more closely. Even though I think some people are going to start playing this and go, where are all the bad guys? I think that's just an expectation that has been bred by the consistent churn mill of enemy deaths, known as Far Cry, and in some ways, Ubisoft titles. That's it for me. Peace out. Check out the patron and the podcast. Gang, gang.